Ladies and gentlemen, please take a look at this gorgeous dish. This is beef bourguignon. This is the classic French beef dish and the wonderful sauce that goes with it. Wait till you taste this. <laughs> You're going to be surprised at just how delicious it can really be. Howdy folks. Welcome to Texas Cooking Today. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a Texas Cooking Today tutorial. And on this show, I'm gonna be teaching you everything about this recipe. We're gonna go into detail about methodology, technique, everything is gonna get taught here. I would like to say thank you for watching. And if you don't need a video this long that's this detailed, guess what? The previous episode is just the recipe, kind of bare like most other people on uh, internet do their videos. So I'll tell you what, take a look at that. This one tells you everything about this recipe. Now let's get in the kitchen and let's get busy tearing this up. Come on. Hey folks. Today I'm making beef bourguignon. Beef bourguignon is delicious. Mother, my mom used to live in France, okay? My father was with the Air Force, he was a captain. Um, after the Second World War, he was stationed in Paris, France. Um, and there he would uh, treat his patients, uh, you know, people in the military. Anyway, they transferred him to Texas after that. And of course, um, this is where we were born and raised and uh, where my parents were born and raised and my grandparents. Uh, so we have all of those strong Texas influences. However, mom brought back French cooking and Italian cooking. Uh, so she learned a lot while she was living over there. And we ate magnificent food. And so a lot of what I cook is a reflection of what she's taught me as a child. This particular dish is made in the classic French way. Okay, and this is a classic French dish. It's an old dish, old world dish. It's been around for a long time. And when it's made right, the flavors, they can't be beat. Folks, this is called braising. Now when you braise food, you develop stacked flavors, deep, intense, rich flavors that you can get no other way but to braise. And we're gonna add to it other flavors that are developed with other techniques and methods. So I get to show you a wonderful dish here and give you a fantastic recipe that you're going to be able to cherish for life. This is beef bourguignon made in the classic way. Let's get busy. Now folks, you can't make beef bourguignon without a big old slab of beef. And that's exactly what I have there. That is about three pounds of chuck. Down here, I also have my other ingredients. We have some mushrooms, carrots, shallots, small onions. If you can find pearl onions, just use those. But I picked these since I couldn't find them. This isn't part of beef bourguignon, but I figured some little potatoes would be nice on the side. I'm gonna be using tomato paste, thyme, garlic, salt, bay leaves, some beef broth, and red wine. The red wine needs to be a good quality red wine that you would serve to your guests, guys. You don't want something cheap on the table or cheap ruining the flavor of your good beef bourguignon. So use something that's as good as what you would normally drink. Now folks, I'm about to start cutting up the meat there, but before I jump into the middle of that, you're going to need a good pot to cook this in. You need an oven proof pot. I'm going to be placing this down in my oven. This is a, a cast iron, enameled cast iron Dutch oven, and it works really good for this dish, but you don't have to have something like this. You can use uh, just a regular stainless steel pot, works good, as long as it's oven proof it'll work for this dish. It needs to be oven proof and big enough to hold all of what you're putting in there. So here we're going to get this down in the oven and heat it at 350 degrees. I want to put it in there for 20 minutes so I know that the pot is thoroughly hot throughout and then I'm going to start cooking the meat. Alrighty, it's a heavy little sucker. There we go. Now as that is busy getting heated up, I will then go ahead and start working on 
my beef. Now, if you'll notice, I'm not teaching this the way I normally teach a class, which is we do the setup method first, and then we go into, you know, adding heat and stuff like that. Here, I started with the heat, and then we go to cutting. Well, how strange. Now, if you'll notice what I'm doing here is I'm just pushing the muscles apart. Isn't that cool? There we go. So sometimes it doesn't take a lot of knife work to separate those muscles. And that's where I like to start with a chuck because you know a lot of what you need is already divided for you. Just let the piece of meat guide you along the way. There we go. Now, I got another muscle right here. There we go. I'm just gonna pull it apart. Look at that, I'm doing that mostly with one hand. See, isn't that neat? And there's one more right here. There we go. Now, for the size of pieces of meat you want, about half the size of your fist. So you see that right there? You see my fist? About two of those, boom, would make up my fist, wouldn't it? That simple, boom, boom. Okay, so you're looking for a piece of meat about that size. I'm just going to take these and cut them, cut them down. And if you notice, I'm not going out of my way to remove fat or anything or connective tissues. I don't need to remove that stuff, guys. It's going to add to this dish. It's going to add flavor and depth that you just can't begin to imagine until you've tried it. Our big piece here, this is simple enough. I'm just going to cut it down into pieces the size I need. There is some silver skin on this. Again, Believe it or not, I'm not worrying about that because when you're dealing again with this long cook, it works wonders. I'm also cutting across the grain on this so that it improves what it's gonna be like to eat later on. See, the grain runs this way. I'm cutting across it. It gives you better, way better product. There we go. And that, okay. My meat's all cut up and it's ready to be seared, all right? Okay, let's get this out of the oven. Remember, use something to hold it with. It's gonna be hot. Now, I'm gonna put a flame under this, and that's gonna help me to have heat retention. And the whole idea there is I'm gonna put beef on the bottom of this pan, and I want it to cook up really well, and so I need it to have the right heat. I'm gonna be using some oil. You can use whatever oil you like. As I mentioned, we throw a little water in it and see what happens. You see how the water sizzled off quickly? That means we need to give it a little more time on the flame to finish heating up some more. And when that water kind of skates around in the bottom and it doesn't sizzle off quickly, then our pot is hot enough. In the meantime, I'm also turning my oven down to 250 degrees. Okay, that pot's still heating. Let's throw some water in and see what happens. I'm getting a sizzle off, but I'm seeing some beading. So I've got water beads down here and around the sides that are just kind of floating around in there. Yeah. See how we got it skating in there? Some of it is sizzling off quickly, but we still have water that's uh, skating around which means we're now developing the temperatures that we need to sear beef and to get that really good seared flavor. Get some oil in the bottom of this. There we go. And I'm just gonna take my meat and get it right down in there. I can say this, that the odor is absolutely incredible. Now, see how I'm getting good browning, good development of color. This only takes a few minutes, all right? So don't worry too much that it'll take a long time to brown. If the pot is hot enough, the browning will happen quickly. And if you have a lot of meat and it, you don't have enough room for all of it to brown, don't worry, you've seen what I've done. I still have meat left in my bowl and I'm gonna move some of that that's already cooked over to one side as I finish searing off the rest. Now, 
Understand something, folks. That seared surface, the caramelized surface that's on the meat, that's gonna wash off. The wine and the beef broth, that'll wash that off. But it becomes a part of the dish and it flavors it and it builds on those complex flavors and it will make a wonderful dish even more delicious. So you notice as I put my meat in there, I don't move it, I don't mess with it. I let it sear, okay? I let it develop that brown. And that's what you want. See there? And I've got it in the bottom of the pot too. So here's more of the meat. I made space. As you can see, a beautiful sear going on. Now folks, we have our meat browning over here. Let me show you some things. When it comes to getting the paper off of your garlic, if I haven't shown you this already, you hold it firm between your thumb and first finger and give it a twist. Not so hard you break the meat, but that paper, whoops, there we go. The paper will just come right off the outside of it. Now look at me, I'm all clumsy today. But even with as clumsy as I am, look at that. See that? You don't have to make it hard to get that off. On our rosemary, very simple. Rosemary, you just put your sprigs all together, take a piece of cooking twine, and, and this works for any kind of herb like this. So if you have like, uh, if you're using rosemary for something or thyme or, or any kind of fresh leaves, this works good. I'll take that out. And this is easy to find in the pot and pull out so you get the whole thing at once. Now that we have our beef seared well all the way through, I'm gonna put my beef stock right in there. On top of that, we're gonna pour in that red wine. Now, how much red wine to use? Well, that's easy, guys. You want enough red wine so that the meat is almost completely covered. You want just little bits and tips sticking up. Now, I used, I would say, maybe a cup and a half of red wine right there. And I might add a little bit more. And that's the way braising should be done. You should just see little tips sticking up, just tiny amount. I can add probably, I would say, another half a cup to this and it would be fine. And we are going to add more to it in the form of, there's tomato paste I'm about to put in. So I'm going to get this and put it in there. I'm just going to spread it around a little bit. You don't have to worry about getting that mixed in perfectly. In this cooking cycle, it's going to be a long cooking cycle, that will definitely get worked out. Okay. It'll get worked in there throughout. Now I'm gonna add some salt and I'm gonna put about, oh, half to three quarters of a teaspoon in here, okay? And my thyme right there. We're gonna want bay leaf. Now that's a good size bay leaf, so all I need is one. Folks, for the most part on that garlic, it's gonna disintegrate. I'm going to go ahead and take the scab off, and I have a bad spot on this piece, so I'm going to cut that off and at least take a look and see if the garlic's okay, which it is, and get the rest of those scabs off the end. I like to just remove that because I don't really like to see those in my food once it's cooked up. These only need a simple crushing, no more. When you're doing a long cooking, the garlic is just going to cook down to nothing, okay? So the garlic goes in there. As you notice, I still have that high flame underneath it. And it's come up to a good simmer, and I want that. Before I put it in the oven, I like to see that action going on. I'm adding just a little more red wine, that other half a cup I mentioned. And folks, that's the better part of a bottle right there, okay? Now, if you're using four or five pounds of uh, beef, you're probably gonna be using uh, a lot more and you're gonna need to increase the amount of beef broth you put in there also. And it's going to give you a very, very rich flavor in the end. All right, this is ready to go in the oven. Now, there's two ways to braise. There's called open braising and closed braising. If you want, you can do closed braising. You put a lid on it, stick it in the oven, leave it alone for hours. Or you can do open braising, and that's where you allow some of it to steam out. I'm gonna start with open braising, and once I cook off some of my liquid, if it's looking good, I'll cover it. 
I may not need to cover it, but I can. But it's going to start just like this. Okay, I've just turned off my burner. Let's get this right down in this oven. There it is, folks. Down in the oven. Wonderful. I am only to wait. This is just a matter of patience right now. When it comes to braising, only the meat will tell you when it's ready. Sometimes you'll braise this dish and it may take two, two and a half hours. Other times you'll braise this dish and it may take three or four hours. It takes as long as it takes, folks. And that depends on the beef you got, which cut you used, uh, the quality of the beef. There's a lot of factors. But we want it so that when we put a fork in the meat, the fork slides back out gently and that the meat will come apart easily. Very, very tender beef is what I'm looking for. At that point, I'm ready to go in with those vegetables, get them cooked up, and then we make our gravy and finish off that dish. And it's an easy thing to do. Now, enjoy your day and relax, and we'll take a look at this once it's cooked. I'm getting ready to prepare my vegetables, and I'm gonna start with the onions. I have a pot of water on the stove, it's heating. Next to it, there is a bowl of cold water. We're gonna blanch these, and that'll help remove that outer layer. But before I blanch them, there is a little bit of early prep work. So you'll know, shallots are, you know, they're pretty simple. The smaller ones, a lot of times, are just a single. Sometimes they're double. A lot of times, shallots grow in pairs, okay? So if I am to take, let's see, this outer part off, and I cut gently down the side here. There we go. There we are. See how he splits apart? There we are. So sometimes on shallots, if you decide to use these, you might run into this. So go ahead and separate those as you're getting ready to, um, to do your blanching. Now blanching, what does that do for us? Blanching allows us to easily remove the paper and everything in these inner, thinner outer layers so that this is easier to cook. So what I wanna do is throw it in the hot water after it's been in there for about two minutes and then I throw it into cold water and that sudden temperature change allows those outer layers to loosen up. And on these onions, very similar process. Let me get a small one here. I wanna take those, I wanna just cut off that tip. And this is gonna make it a little easier to handle later. I'm gonna leave that open. The roots I'm gonna leave intact as I blanch this, all right? Okay, let's speed things up a little bit here. Something I wanted to mention to you, as you see me doing, you need to cut the tips off of that, remove any of the loose paper. But guys, don't obsess over that. That's the reason we're gonna be blanching it. It's to remove the paper, but also, often on the outside of an onion or a shallot, you're gonna find that one little thin papery layer, and it doesn't cook well. So if that's on there, we'll be able to get it off also. Sometimes you'll see that outer layer will be part paper and part what seems like usable onion. Trust me, it doesn't usually work out when you try to cook with that. So go ahead and get that off, get the tips removed, and we're gonna move right on to our mushrooms next. It's as simple as that, guys. Don't make this hard. Now, once your bowls are full and we got the mushrooms prepped, then our veggies are ready to go down in our pot. When it comes time to prepare your mushrooms, sometimes there'll be a little soil on them. Just use a brush and gently brush that off if necessary. All right, or you can use a paper towel or a soft cloth and do the same thing. Okay, so the idea there is any dirt you see, just kind of knock it off. These do not have to be washed and it's really best if you don't, all right? It's not good to get mushrooms in contact with a lot of water and, uh, they, they're, they're like little sponges. They will soak up whatever is around them. So if I pre-soak these with water, then they're just gonna taste, well, kind of plain Jane. I want these to soak up some of my sauce in a little bit and to become flavored with that. Now don't be confused by the gills coming out of this that are somewhat brown. That isn't dirt, okay? just the crumbles of dirt on the outside are. Whether or not to use the stem, 
Some people like them, some people do not. All right, so here's, I want to sort of give you an, an in-between here. Let's cut off the excess, leave the cap filled, and simply quarter it. Just like that. Isn't that simple enough? And those stems, the excess stems, we'll just set aside. So I don't really like to use the stems very much, but I don't mind the part that's up in the cap itself. The smaller mushrooms, like this one, just simply half it, okay? And if they're real little bitty, you may not even have to do that. The mushrooms don't need anything else until it's time to cook them. These were about to blanch. The water is coming up in temperature. Our water is boiling, so now it's time to blanch these. Now, all we have to do, we pour those in the boiling water, give them about one to two minutes. Doesn't take long. And then we're going to pull them out and dash them right down in this cold water. Just as soon as I pull the shallots out, I'll do the other batch, which are the white onion. And that has been about two minutes right there. It's right down in the cold. Now guys, and you can see some of the skins already starting to come off some of them. This is just the same thing that you can do for uh, you like tomatoes. If you want to get the skin off of a tomato, blanch it first. Makes it a lot easier. And then we'll chill them right down. Now these, I'm just going to take them and looky here. See how the outer part comes right off of that. Any thin parts will come off. Even if it was one of the inner layers, if it was too thin, it'll peel off in this process. So there we have it. The shallot is ready to have the root trimmed and it can go down in our dish. So now our last part, we simply take that root and very gently just cut the callus part of it off. It doesn't have to be a deep cut, folks. All right. I think it's time to take a look and see how our beef bourguignon is coming out. Oh, that looks beautiful. Come take a look. I am going to go ahead and remove some of the more visible spices and herbs. They're simply not needed anymore. They're played out. They've released their flavor. Everything that they were giving to this dish is now down in the liquid here. Okay. Now I need to check my meat and see if it's getting good and tender the way I'm hoping it is. Well, I can say this. That is very tender. Yeah, I see how it's pulling apart and breaking. Perfect, okay? We're at the right point that if I want, I can go ahead and start cooking up the rest of my vegetables right down in this. When I do this, I'm gonna put the lid on it for the vegetables. So let's get that done. These are gonna to need to be down in there for a little while, about another 30 minutes. Very nice. Now, I'm also going to add just a little bit of hot water. There we go, just a little bit. Doesn't need a whole lot. Now, that was maybe a cup of extra water. And cover it. It goes back down in the oven to finish up. I went ahead and increased the heat just a little bit uh, to just a little over 300 degrees for finishing this off. So that will help speed up the final cook on those veggies and allow the flavors between all of the vegetables and those meat juices to marry and for a fabulous dish to be born. Our cooking has been an additional 30 minutes now. Oh man, that smells good. Oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. I need to move everything from in here to here so I can get the liquids poured out of here. Then I can just transfer everything back. Now what I'm trying to do is simply get all of this into this pot so I can pour off my liquids. 
doing it this way may be a little bit slower than pouring it through a, a colander or something like that. However, it's a lot less messy and a little bit safer. You're not gonna slosh the liquids quite as easy this way. The vegetables are still firm, which is wonderful. That way they have a nice texture. You know, you don't want to cook your vegetables down until they're gross and soggy and limp and uh, kind of slimy. It's just, it's just not nice to do that, okay? Okay. Everything else just gets poured right back into my original pan. And folks, the oven is turned off, but I'm gonna put this pan right back down into the oven to keep everything nice and hot, and we'll put it in there open. And now I'm gonna thicken this up. To do that, I'm gonna be using flour. Now, traditionally, French cooking, you would have used a bourmagne, and which is butter and flour mixed together. You just kinda of warm your butter up to room temperature and mix your flour into it, and there's your bourmagne. Um, but that's usually done to keep a, a stable thickening product in commercial kitchens. I find when you're thickening a pot like this, what works really well for me is to take flour in a shaker. This is a standard bar shaker and I put in some water. Now you can also use a, like a mason jar or something like that for this. The, the real thing that you want to remember and absolutely know is never put hot water down in there because oh, you do that and you're in for some trouble. So I'm gonna pour in cold water and I'm gonna put in probably, yeah, an entire cup there. There we go, put the lid on and give it a shake. There we go. All right, so I have my thickener ready and this works the same way that the Bourmanier works. It just, uh, the whole idea is to get the flour down in that hot liquid to thicken it up. As you can see, we now have a good boiling action on our juices, our pot liquor. I'm gonna pour in some of that flour and water, about half of what I had there. I'm just gonna let that come back to a boil. Now it only has to boil for a moment for you to know how thick it's gonna be and whether you're gonna need more or less, but this is just a good way of doing this. That was about one third of a cup of flour, one cup of water, and that becomes your thickening agent. And guys, I've been doing gravy like this for decades. It works like a charm. But whether you do this, my method, by mixing it with water and pouring it in, or using the old French method, which is making a bourmagne and then whisking that butter and flour mixture into this mixture. Either way, you're gonna to have to cook it afterwards. You have to cook this for about 10 to 15 minutes to get rid of that raw flour taste. It needs to be cooked and if it's not, you're gonna have a raw flour flavor in it and it's not that good, okay? So that's that all there is to that. Now I'm bringing this up to a boil again now be careful when you have a whisk sitting on the side of your pot like I have here. Be careful that you don't leave it there too long and come and grab it and burn yourself. These things will get hot sitting on the side of a pot. So this is thickening nice, but I'm gonna add just a little more of my mixture, about half as much of, as what I had left. There we go, and I'm already feeling that getting a little bit heavier. All right, folks. It is out of the oven. My sauce is finished cooking, that beautiful burgundy sauce. Now, let's pour this right over the top. Looky there. Isn't that just decadent? There we go. Won't necessarily take it all, always. And it never hurts to have a little extra. How much of all of this did I use? I started with three pounds of chuck. That's a good sizable amount and will feed, for the most part, three to four people. In addition, you're gonna be wanting anywhere from, oh, roughly eight to 12 
larger onions like I had here. These are actually kind of a small medium onion, but for this dish, they're large. Uh, or if you've got pearl onions, just double that amount. You're going to want a nice full bowl of pearl onions if you can find them. Your mushrooms, you're going to need some good sized mushrooms there. Once they're all cut up, you know, you're, well, you're looking at about, what, seven, eight mushrooms total. And once they're cut up, of course, quartered, they're going to give you a lot of pieces of mushroom. That way everybody gets plenty on their plate. The carrot isn't really something that you normally see in beef bourguignon, but it is sometimes included and it works very well in it. So folks, if you want to put carrots in there, do so. Our ingredient amount on these items, we use anywhere from two to four ounces of tomato paste. You can also adjust, add more of the tomato paste to increase the acidity of the dish. Anywhere from uh, three or four sprigs of thyme, two to four cloves of garlic, one half to one teaspoon of salt, one to two bay leaves, one cup of beef broth, and then enough wine to bring the liquids up to where they're almost completely covering the meat. And that's how much of all of that to use. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at that gorgeous dish. Looky there, <laughs> isn't that beautiful? There is your beef bourguignon, ladies and gentlemen, and it needs to be enjoyed with friends and family. This is a special dish, and it's a good one for the holiday season. Winter's wonderful dish. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? The way a good quality beef bourguignon should be. Now, a little bit of cleaning up on my plate just to finish it off. And that's the thing, we wanna make it look like a very good quality, clean presentation. So you see I push, not sideways, but straight in towards my liquid to clean up any overspills or anything that doesn't really look nice and fresh. Okay, so we want that plate to look sharp. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are. Beautiful, gorgeous. That is the way a wonderful beef bourguignon should be done. It's one of those dishes that I just love making. Look at that, how that meat just pulls free. Mmm. Oh, yeah. You know, beefy. What's the neat thing about Chuck? Long cooking, and the flavor it gets is unbelievable. And that sauce, combination of savory and sweet and the fruitiness in it. It's fantastic, guys. Definitely a dish worth every bit of the time that you put into it. Thank you very much for watching. If you would, please share this recipe with your friends. Please subscribe. I know a wine that pairs perfectly with this. Folks, check out my other recipes. There's a lot on there. Some good stuff. You have a good day. Bye-bye. Folks, thank you very much for watching Texas Cooking today. Another fantastic recipe. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions or comments, please drop them below. Thank you for watching this episode. Also, if you would please check out my channel, please share this video. And folks, please also have a good day and enjoy the view.